Hey friends, welcome back to the Inner Experience podcast with Sam Massa. Holy crap, I'm so excited to be in season two. And as we all know, season two is all about the dance of the masculine and feminine. And I wanted to firstly, before we go into this episode, just really briefly talk about why, like why this is happening and why I'm really passionate about this particular theme. And what was going on for me is that although this is part of my growth right now, this has kind of been evolving the last couple of years, I was also going through this phase of realizing that my work in the health and wellness space, the holistic health, the fasting was strongly, uh, a strong theme was occurring around people's disconnection to self. And so I began exploring that more. So a lot of the stuff that I did with fasting was around fasting for self-love or a lot of the work I did with my coaching one-on-one is like people might come to me with a health issue or wanting to fast, but we'd find that we were actually working on deeper levels, on emotional stuff, on, on connecting to who we are. And it was amazing of what actually shifts when we begin to do that. So my kind of interest, I guess, and my passion kept moving in that direction really strongly. And then I learned this work around the masculine and feminine and I got so curious. And then I started to, as I do go deeper into the work because I'm like an all in kind of, all right, roll up my sleeves. Like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like, I think I have more of a threshold for emotional work and like, and going deep within than I do for like climbing the mountain (laughs) and like doing a physical training exercise. Like some people are great with like hit training and going for it. And I'm like, Oh, like maybe I'll just like roll up my sleeves and do some emotional work. So that's where I sit on the spectrum. So when I want to go all in with some, some growth stuff, I go all in. Um, so this is where this has kind of come up for me. And I've noticed so much in the way it's resonating with people, the way it's like, a tr- it's like more of my clients, it's coming up in, in the work with them, more people are just in this conversation. And I'm also noticing that there's also people that are curious, but are like, wait, what the heck are you on about? Like, what's this language? What does this even mean? Oh, and so there's this curiosity thing that's taking place right now. So I find with podcasts is that typically I do like the dance of the masculine and feminine, like I did in season one with Josh Stigma. And it was one of the best episodes, like the favorite episodes and people were like, I want to know more. And that's what happens with this type of conversation, right? Like you kind of scratch the surface and you want to know more. So I'm scratching the surface on this topic and I'm going deeper so that we can all have more. And that means I get to talk to more people and more topics, but like explore it in a, in a um, fuller way. And yeah, I'm excited about that. So that's where that, this is kind of, just to give you some background, this is kind of where I'm at. Um, this, this season is going to see a lot of vulnerability. So please don't be scared because, you know, we don't even have to tell me you're watching, but you're going to see vulnerability on my end, like a heck load. Um, you're going to see it on the speaker's end. And it's also going to show and be pretty upfront, authentic and real about where I'm at and what's where my work has been happening. and. Uh, although these are pre-recorded interviews, like you're going to see like what was happening in that, those moments with where I was at in this kind of, what, what can we call it? Practice, let's call it. So you're going to understand a lot more about the language that I'm using. You're going to be understanding a lot more about what it's, what it can do for you when you understand this energy within us, because the masculine and feminine isn't about talking about men and women per se. It's about the masculine and feminine energy that's within us, the yin yang, the structure, the flow, the alpha omega, like all of this stuff that's within us. And when we understand this, oh oh gosh, like everything changes. So just to then progress into today's episode, this is the first episode and I really wanted to debunk the masculine and feminine. Basically, I wanted to start with an episode so you can understand that the masculine and feminine might mean different things. And I've decided to bring in somebody who is doing amazing work in this field. You'll see him online. You'll see him, um, you know, he shares a lot of amazing stuff, especially on Instagram, if you follow him. And he's, yeah, he's just in the work and helping people. And I really, really love it. And his name is Stefanos Sifandos. Stefanos Sifandos, what a name. (laughs) And he's been immersed in deep men's empowerment work and the exploration of intimate and sacred relationships, merging the best of Eastern and Western methodologies and philosophies to 
promote balance, sacredness, and power in life and love. He uses a range of different techniques and methods, but he's created programs, models, and systems to enhance the quality of your life, your intimate relationships, and in essence, bring you closer to your potential. And yeah, he has a lot of amazing stuff to say in this, in this episode, we talk about the attributes of the masculine and feminine energies so that we can begin to understand what it means and how it relates to all genders. We talk about understanding who we are at our core essence, emotionally, spiritually, physically, and psychologically. And this is really cool. Like he takes me through times where I'm more masculine, times where I'm more feminine and and where you are at your core and how you can follow along. We also look at looking at the unhealthy and healthy healthy masculine and feminine way of being. So often you hear the word like toxic masculine. And instead of that word, that's a bit charged. We're using the word unhealthy and healthy because there's definitely unhealthy and healthy ways of being in general. And there's definitely unhealthy and healthy ways of being masculine and being feminine or having that show up within us. So we explore this in depth. It's an, it's a great episode to start you off on this topic and probably get you itching for a little bit more. So let me know what you think of this episode. And before we dive in, I just wanted to shout out to my women because uh, putting this together, I've seen a kind of big rise in people interested in this work and me wanting to work with women on the feminine. and as I'm exploring deeper realms of this within myself, I was really inspired recently and touched and also like my heart broke a little bit as I was talking to a client who said to me, Sam, like, stop talking about this self love stuff. I don't even self like myself. Oh, and hearing that I literally had sat with it for like two weeks. I was like, Whoa, like, that's huge. And I know that she's not the only one. And I get emotional thinking about it right now because I totally remember being in that situation. Like I totally remember those times where like, like I doesn't even matter what good I did or what I was doing in my life. Like the self like bar was not even there. So I'm looking for five women who want to explore the, the entry level to the feminine of understanding who they are, of beginning to turn up the dial on their self-like, to turn it into self-love, to stop people pleasing, to build confidence within themselves, to feel sexy, to feel pleasure in their body. And how do we even do that? So I'm looking for five people, five women. This is going to be a six week journey. Um, If you're curious at all in exploring this work, it's going to be small and intimate and exactly the right safe place for you to explore this work. And uh, yeah, if you're interested, I'm taking applications right now and then and throughout August. So please hit me up. Um, if you have more questions, send me a message, but otherwise um, there is a link in the show notes that you just need to click to apply and I'll get back to you. But otherwise I'm really passionate about this work because we need to, we need self-love. If you want to relate to people, if you want to deepen your intimacy, your, your purpose in life, what you do in this world, how you show up, how you feel, how you walk through life. You want that to be like, if you know that there's another, another level that you can be walking, then this is it. It starts with us. And that's the same for men as well. But right now I'm concentrating on, on a small group of women because when we come together, it's freaking powerful. So if you're interested, hit that up on the, on another note, Let's dive into today's ex- exercise. <laughs> Let's dive into today's episode that will have exercises that you won't want to miss because roll up your sleeve, friends, with me and join me on the ride of the dance of the masculine and feminine, season two of the inner experience. And now, Stefanos. Stefanos, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I'm excited to chat today. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, I love what you share, especially on Instagram. So for y'all who aren't following Stephanos, you need to get on that. (laughs) Um, But I really wanted to start by kind of debunking the whole um, festival, Um, masculine and feminine language per se. Um, I feel like that's an important topic, especially as we dive into this season that's based all around this topic. Um, So firstly, let's start at like how you kind of Fell, like fell into this work or your direction or um, you know how this led you to this I'd love to know yeah 
So I, I essentially, I fell into this work and this work found me and I found this work because of intense pain I was experiencing in relationship, um, relationship to myself and relationship to others, particularly romantic intimate partnership. And so this gave me an opportunity to really understand not only the human mind, but also what I call polarity dynamics. So understanding this reality of duality that we live in, uh, masculine, feminine, uh, doing, being, going, flowing energy. And then as they're not my terms as Michaela Baum, um, I believe has coined that uh, either way I've heard it from her, but it's another way to look at masculine feminine dynamics because sometimes we get confused around masculinity and femininity being completely or solely exclusively associated with men and with women or with males and females. And it's not the case really, really clearly masculine feminine energies are simply contrasted expressions or ways of doing and being in the world that reside within every human being, within every, every conscious human being. Um, and then, I mean, I mean, I probably shouldn't say conscious because that opens up another can of worms. But within, within every thinking and feeling human being, right? Um, and, and so, even, even like if you look at the terms that we use in the world, uh, we use uh, very opposite terms. Night and day. we understand day because of night. We understand night because of day. We understand up because of down. We understand down because of up. To give you an example. You can't go left if there's no right. What's left going from? Do you know what I mean? Yes. And so, and so masculine feminine is somewhat in its opposite and it's just a different way of expressing in the world and ultimately we need both now depending on who you speak to uh, and i do hold this belief that men will have or it's natural or an organic and healthy for men to have a more masculine essence core essence and for women to have a more feminine core essence that's not to say that men don't uh, carry any uh, feminine attributes or don't have access to that or cannot uh, apply that in the everyday world or in situations that require a completely different approach or in relationship and vice versa for women as well. And so I, I believe it's important that, you know, I often get the question, this, this often gets asked to me at least a couple of times a week, what do men need to do and it will be asked in different ways. So it will either be asked, what do men need to do to be more feminine? And I, and I, I immediately start to <laughs> do this. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Mom. Like, why do you want your man to be feminine? That, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, it does from particular perspectives, right? Um, or how does a man tap into more feminine expression? And that's a beautiful, the way, the way that's worded is a beautiful question. Right. Uh, and my immediate response is step deeper into his healthy masculine. Mm -hmm. And what will happen, he, was, he will organically, very naturally, be more in his feminine attributes when they are called for. Mm -hmm. The beauty of, of only taking ownership of our core essence, moving away from this movement of equality and more into equity. Because we are different. We're biologically different. We're internally different. We're, we're, to some extent, of course, socially conditioned to be different. And of course, that's a, a variable that can definitely shift and change. But we are different. Our brains function different, differently. Our hormonal profiles are different. I'm saying we. I'm talking about men and women. I'm talking about males and females, gender-wise. And so, with that, that physiology does affect our emotionality, our, our way, the way that we relate, the way that we see ourselves, the way we understand the world. Um, our, you know, quote unquote, our superpowers are different as well. Mm. And so it's not about wrong or right. It's just that what's happened is over years, and there are many reasons for this, we've been conditioned to believe that the masculine way of doing things or even the masculine way of being in the world is superior. That's not the case. It's not, it's not true. It's the case, but it's not true. It's a false propaganda that we've been weaving uh, for so many centuries, well, more than that, thousands of years. And so the issue then comes is when we start to address that, you've got people, I don't want to go too much on a tangent here, but you've got, you've got one camp saying, well, why are you defacing masculinity? And that's, that's not healthy either. And that's not true because so many people are entrenched in a particular way of being and they're scared of losing their, their way of life. And then you've got the other camp that says, well, we we can't pardon the background noise. I can hear the police sirens. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> we can't. I'm hoping you can't hear them. We can't have 
femininity and masculinity on the same page. And there's, there's, there's fallacy in that as well. And so we're at a, we're at a real crossroads. I feel, as I, what I perceive is that we're at a massive crossroads right now. We can either go deeper into separation and isolation ultimately, or come into greater coherence and collaboration. And so when we're talking about coherence and collaboration, we're essentially speaking to feminine attributes or feminine expressions or feminine energies or feminine qualities. And I feel that there's an element of that that really needs to happen. And that doesn't take away man's masculinity. It only, it only gets taken away when man is in his shadow masculine. So if we look at the archetypes, we look at the king arch, arch, uh, archetype or the sovereign archetype, there's, there's elements and that's essentially leadership. And there are many uh, characteristics that fall under that, of course. Mm-hmm. But you, you can split that into shadow leadership or you can split you can go into healthy leadership and so those that are, have this great fear around losing their sense of self are more often than not not always but more often than not coming from that shadow place of leadership which is autocratic and oppressive and controlling and they want to retain that it's grounded in fear whereas a leader who is sure of himself and connected to his truth doesn't have that fear because realizes that his authentic expression will always be there because that's what he values. Mm. Whoa. Okay. This is so good. And let's, I want to go back to, there's a few parts that I want to touch on on what you've just said, because I love it. Um, and I really, I really deeply resonate with what you're saying. And the first part would be, um, just, just a, a little bit more on the expression of the masculine feminine, um, doing being, can we like, do you, how do you, how do you identify, uh, what you might be more strongly in an essence with like what what are some more attributes of the masculine what are some more attributes of the feminine so people can kind of if they don't understand this language just yet like what else they can kind of resonate with Mm -hmm. sure so i'll give you some attributes of uh, masculine expression or masculine um, character uh, and masculine embodiment uh, masculine sorry masculine embodiment and then i'll give you some examples of feminine as well Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll, 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 then I'll go into, and then I'll go into, I'll lead into a couple of other different examples, but let me, I'll start here. So for example, and again, these attributes are not limited to men or limited to women. So let me just start with compassion because that's a, I think that's just an, an easy one to start with. Compassion is, I mean, you could probably guess it's a feminine attribute. That doesn't mean that men shouldn't be compassionate or men don't carry compassion. I think we've seen many leaders. There are many examples. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi is one of them that carried deep Martin Luther King that carried men that carried deep compassion in their hearts for a world that they saw that was more inclusive and more collaborative. Again, collaboration, inclusivity are more feminine attributes. That doesn't mean that there wasn't structure, structure is a masculine attribute. I'm telling a story and I'm just, and I'll sort of pick and stop yeah. and say, hey, that's a masculine attribute. That there wasn't structure and leadership. Leadership is a masculine attribute. That doesn't mean that there aren't any f- amazing female leaders, Rosa Parks, Oprah Winfrey, uh, there are so many people that are doing great work that combine a sense of both masculine and feminine energies in their way of being in the world. You, to be an effective leader, to be someone that is really present in the world, you can't not have both. You have to have both. And so if we're looking at other masculine um, attributes, we can look at rationality being one. Uh, we can look at being very focused and singular that's a, when you're in that space and in that zone you're in a masculine energy when you're goal orientated when you're when you when you're carrying a sense of completion in yourself today's you know contemporary sex most of contemporary sex and for many reasons one of them being pornography is all about masculine energy it's all about completion it's all about finishing it's about attaining a target the target is orgasm i need orgasm he or she needs orgasm I need orgasm it's com- it's a masculine energy that's been thrown into a sexual dynamic that isn't purely about completion. So we can see the issues that, that happen here. Being purposeful. When you're in, when you're in uh, your purpose, when you're on your purpose, when you're living on point, when you're really focused, again, when you're determined to achieve something, and you're goal-orientated, that's, that's masculine energy. When you're in a protective stance, when you're in a stance of providing you're in a masculine energy. When we look at divorce rates, they're so high right now. There are so many single parents, predominantly females, mothers raising young boys or children, but young boys in this instance. 
And so they're assuming a role of protector and provider. Yeah, they're assuming a role of having to do and be in the world, having to do in the world and, and create wealth and support in the world. And so these women, fortunately or unfortunately, that, that judgment value is irrelevant at this point, but they're thrown into a very masculine dynamic because survival is always primary. Survival is always, and survival is generally for millions of years has been the, the domain of man more than anything else in terms of direct connection to environment. So we're talking about evolutionary psychology here. Okay. Not to say that women have never had to survive. Of course they've had to in their own way, in a different way. But traditionally, and when I say traditionally, I'm talking about evolutionarily over a million to two million years, men have been at the forefront of surviving in the environment, extending the perimeter, exploring new lands, hunting, collecting, protecting, making sure that the space, the internal shelter is, is completely protected. And of course, women would lend themselves to that as well. But women traditionally had other roles. And so culture and society developed from these basic biological functions. And that's why we can't separate the two. You can't separate physiology and psychology and, and, and emotions and spirituality and culture. They can't be completely separated, right? And so if we come back to feminine expressions for a moment, we're talking about gentleness. We're talking about compassion. We're talking about affection. We're talking about care. I mean, again, there's nothing more beautiful than, than, than a woman who is deeply compassionate and empathetic and affectionate and tender and has this beautiful connected energy and is inspired. Being inspired is a feminine um, trait. Being more motivated with the mind is more of a masculine trait. We need both. So there are times where we need to be motivated, where we need to have mental resilience and grit and we have to have mental toughness. And there are other times where we need to be more naturally aspirated and inspired by life and movement through the world. What we miss out on so much in this world, in the way that we relate, is that we sometimes think it has to be one or the other, and it doesn't need to be that way. In a moment, a, a given moment may call for one expression over the other, because you, can't, you sort of can't be both at the same time. You, just, you can't be happy and sad at the same time. And you can't be... Um, you can't be dominant and submissive at the same time as well. And these are just polarities, right? You, you have to oscillate. You may oscillate really quick the where it appears that it's the same, but that's not the case. We, we, we oscillate. And so we have to understand that first and foremost, it doesn't have to always be one or the other permanently as a permanent fixture within our uh, character expression, our psyche and our relationships. And secondly is what can, what can your core essence be? So let me, let me ask you, uh, no, let me give you an example of, um, we have various bodies. So we have the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, um, the psychological, we can call it the relational bodies as well. So I, outside of physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual, for me, there's four bodies. And then maybe you can have relational body. And obviously you've got layers like the ethereal body and so forth. But without getting too complicated, we're made up essentially, human beings, of four bodies. Physical, psychological, spiritual, and emotional. If we just take the physical body for a moment, if you're one of those people, and this is a question for you, okay? Mm -hmm. So are you one of those people that the majority of the time, call it the majority of the time, would you prefer, if I give you two options, tell me which you would prefer the majority of the time. Would you prefer to be dancing and moving in your feminine flow and putting beautiful music on and, and candles and scents and so forth and moving your body to music and just really flowing with life, yeah? Or... Would you rather go to the gym and have a massively hard workout, kick bags, smash, lift heavy kettlebells, uh, like CrossFit Games style, style stuff? What would your preference be? The dance, the first option. So the, that means that you, you have more of a feminine core essence in your physical body. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you don't like training hard and maybe no. having a hard workout. Absolutely. Yeah, because I love that stuff as well. But ultimately in that question, it was like, yeah, that for sure. Yeah, so your core essence in your physical body yep. is feminine. Mm -hmm. Which is, by the way, to a healthy man, very attractive. Now, in saying that though, because I want to clarify something here. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with, in, in my opinion, I find it beautiful as well. And I really resonate with it when I see a woman doing the, I say the CrossFit Games because I just finished and CrossFit Games are a very masculine, uh -huh. masculine sport, a very masculine expression. I find it fucking amazing and I'm in awe and I'm deeply inspired and I find it attractive when I see women absolutely just going for it in that way as well. Yeah. But I would say their core essence in their physical body is more masculine. 
That doesn't make them less feminine though. Mm -hmm. There's still other bodies that they have, right? right. Yes. expressions that we have too. That's very important as well. Mm. In the emotional body, for example, um, are you someone that likes to, if you're having an emotional conflict or relationship with someone, or you're having a relationship with someone, sorry, and in that relationship you're having a conflict or we can call it an argument or a disagreement or there's some pain being exchanged, are you the type of person that just wants to get it done, get it solved, get to the point, really, or do you want to take some time expressing feelings, being heard, hearing that other person? What is it, first or second? A second. So you're more in your feminine body and the emotional. Mm -hmm. body as well. So now we're starting to get a bit of a picture of someone's core essence. Yeah. Yeah. And there are many other questions you can ask to help. I mean, I'm giving you very simple examples. I don't want to overwhelm the audience and overwhelm um, the conversation either. Yeah, but, this is good. I mean, they're, they're fairly legitimate um, questions. They're, they're, to me, they're pretty obvious. They're not, they're not hyper complex. Yeah. And the, can we do the last two? Cause this is so interesting. Oh, like spirituality? Yeah. Well, yeah, spirituality and uh, psychology. Yep. Okay, cool. So spirituality, let me think of a question. Got it. Okay. So would you prefer in your spirituality to maybe be um, in your, because let me just actually define spirituality because it's such an abstract term for me, and this is just my definition of spirituality. It's definitely a recognition and a connection to the immaterial, um, to what we can't see, to what is not tangible. And spirituality fundamentally for me is about connectedness. Mm -hmm. It's all about how are we connecting to a source that is grander than us that we, we often can't see. It's not tangible. Yeah. Because that's yeah. how I define spirituality. Um, and also in saying that I, I do follow a, uh, like a belief of panentheism where everything is spiritual. Everything is the cosmos, you know, like the cosmos is spirituality itself as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the body making love, eating food, that's all spiritual too. It's not just about the immaterial, the intangible. So the question I would have for you, would your preference be to sit in still, complete stillness and silence and go within yourself and be and, and, and attain expansiveness through stillness and silence and going within? Or would your preference be to chant, to be in a group, to do maybe like a, a yogic practice um, and it can be on your own as well, but is it more around breath, sound, and movement? What would be your preference? Um, the first one. First one. Cool. Yeah. So for you in your spirituality, and of course I'll ask you a few more questions to really get clear on that. Mm -hmm. But in your spirituality, your core essence is more masculine. Mm -hmm. Again, does that mean you look very feminine to me? <laughs> I think you, you don't look like a man to me. So there's, there's having a core essence of whatever it may be. It doesn't, doesn't make you less or more of that gender mm -hmm. and we you know the, we have to get away from that but let's, let's yeah yeah, I see, yeah. So we'll the next, one. <laughs> next one or the mind okay so i'm gonna appropriate one to ask okay so first question are you when it comes to challenges or problem solving are you the type of person that wants to be internal and analytical, like highly analytical and internal and figure it out yourself? Or are you happy to be more creative and collaborative to problem solve or go through challenges? If you had to have a preference. Ooh. Um, I actually think this is an interesting one because I actually think it's number two. Mm -hmm. deep down yep. but when it comes to the thing like a challenge i often will go i can handle this and i'll try and do it on my own yeah yeah mm -hmm. and that there that beautiful so firstly your 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 core essence is more feminine in, in your psyche right and secondly if i may ref, may i reflect some an observation there? Mm -hmm. you're a product of your society we are all products of our society and i remember what we said at the beginning around our, our society um, really valuing masculine dynamics and it values individuation. It values solidarity. Mm -hmm. It values independence. It values doing things on your own. And so you will be more inclined naturally to go there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting because 
like before getting into this kind of work is that's where I was. Like I was like independent woman and I can do this on my own and like I've got this and I need to have it sorted and I can't be too much and I can't be too of this and like all of this stuff that was just like suppressing the feminine that was actually in me and it's taking a lot of kind of commitment to this work to, to allow that out and be like fully accepting of who I am, right? So I feel like a lot of people would be able to resonate with that. And then on the flip side is even men, right? Like suppress, suppression of the feminine within men is, is like a huge thing. Yeah, there are so many men that I know that want to reach out for help and don't. Yeah. That, that want that, uh, like whether it's a, a problem at work where they, 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 it's self-imposed and it's also external pressure that's placed upon them to figure it out on their own. Mm -hmm. Look, sometimes you're going to need to. There's nothing, let me be really clear. I'm not, I'm not saying let's all be collaborative and inclusive. The human brain cannot fathom intimacy beyond 150 to 200 persons, maximum. Mm -hmm. Like I'm really pushing the limits there on that. There's no way you can be inclusive and collaborative with 7.7 .7 billion people. It's not going to work. So I'm not, I'm not saying let's throw out masculinity. The opposite, I'm saying let's embrace healthy masculinity. Yeah. Because there are going to be times where you're in a situation where you need to be autonomous and you need to be very directed and clear and you need to figure out shit on your own. And that, that, having that masculine energy and access to that is really important as well and yeah. necessary in our world. Absolutely. And so there's two points now that I want to go on. And the, the, going back to where you talked about equality, this is so interesting because I totally agree with the fact that we're both different like men and women no matter what your kind of sexual preference or whatever it is it's like we're just different bio biologically so so what is that what is kind of like this this kind of i feel anger towards this like not me specifically but it feels like an anger kind of energy towards this equality thing mm -hmm. that i don't know that it is going to be is serving any purpose so what is what is your kind of perception on on equality and and understanding it yeah yeah let me just understand the question because there's two ways i can interpret it and I'm, maybe it's both ways but, but are you saying that there's an anger towards um uh, and there's an anger towards people shutting down equality or there's an anger saying we want equality we want equality that one the okay. second option yeah yeah, and so very simple, very simple, and and rightly so, by the way. Mm -hmm. So any minority group that has been suppressed or oppressed for a very fucking long time, mm. is going to want to scream equality. What they're really screaming, and rightly so, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. agreed. Mm -hmm. But what they're really asking for, and I don't want to put words in people's mouth and tell them what they're really wanting. I don't mean to come from that place. Definitely not. But what what psychodynamics, what what psychology tells us, what they're really asking for is equity. And that is more access, equal access to resources. Mm. But to say that we need to do the same things, that, that's, I mean, we can. I, I can play various cultural roles that traditionally women would play. And you as a woman can play various cultural roles that traditionally men would play. And at some point, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Like that's mm. actually healthy. It's okay. It's, it's part of the evolution of society that we're, the, the the layers of society that we're developing because the complexity of culture now compared to hundreds of thousands of years ago is very, very different and far more. But there also comes a point where as a woman, you're naturally more adept and more proficient at certain things. And so it would pay for me to learn from you and vice versa as well. And so this this equality it's not so much about equality it's more about in my from my vantage point it's more about equity yeah. and i'm a big proponent of that i'm a big supporter of we need to have equal access to resources this disparity in wealth and this disparity in how we access resources and how we're treated in a society and it's not again really clear here it's not going to go away immediately like it's not i'd love it to i'm gone not going to happen mm -hmm. trench systemic ideologies and practices collective practices that have been in our world for so long they're oppressive practices that when organizations such as the un bring out charters on whether it be human rights and inequality and so forth all that really happens is they the the the, the, the some things do change but so much just becomes systemic and more quiet more in the shadows and that changing requires massive, consistent effort 
and continuous awareness building. And I actually think part of it is taking ownership for who we are as, as men and who we are as women and, and who we are as just as people full stop as well. That's yeah. really as well. Absolutely. And you talk about, you've mentioned a few times like the healthy masculine, the healthy feminine, how does this play a part? Like, how does this show up? And is there an, is there like an unhealthy one that we need to kind of be aware of? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's so many different characteristics that both the masculine and the feminine hold that there's always a counterpart. So there's a healthy expression and an unhealthy expression. I mean, you can, excuse me, you can call it toxic or you can call it extreme. You can call it whatever you like. Um, and, and just to clear something up there as well, I think it's important. Um, this, this term toxic masculinity, um, it's not a healthy term. And at the same time, people need to get the fuck over this term toxic masculinity because we're focusing on verbiage and we're, 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 we're focusing on a narrative as opposed to going deeper in the issue. Into yeah. the issue. So what I mean by that is firstly, if there's toxic masculinity by default, there's toxic femininity. And mm -hmm. if there's toxic masculinity by default, there's healthy masculinity. Not all men are toxic. Not all women are toxic. Mm -hmm. Not all masculinity is toxic. Not all femininity is toxic. There's a balance between the two. There's unhealthy and I, that's why I prefer healthy and unhealthy expressions because it sort of takes away the stigma and we get less on the conversation of, oh, don't use the term toxic masculinity and more on the conversation of, okay, so what does that actually mean and how can we be healthy? Because if you lined up a hundred people and you said to them, hey, do you prefer to feel healthy and be healthy in your expression and in your relationships or do you prefer to be unhealthy? A hundred out of a hundred are going to say, hey, I'd like to be healthy unless they have a pathology, right? Yes. So, it doesn't mean that the unhealthy doesn't have anything to teach us. It simply means that it's an undesirable state of being. Right. It's kind of like feedback. Correct. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Like, you know, fear is feedback. Failure is feedback. It's a feedback. It doesn't mean that we, we're going to constantly want to fail and, and feel fear because it's a feedback. It just means <laughs> that it, it, has a, it has a value attached to it. If we learn from it, we'll stop experiencing undesirable states. Yes. We'll yeah. We'll experience them less often. I love that. Like, it's like an opportunity in it to be like, okay, I'm not going to stay in, let's call it victim mode or like whatever. It's like an excuse to stay there. It's like an opportunity to see, okay, I can, I can actually yeah. step into something else. And that's exciting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so when we're talking about masculinity and femininity, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's an interesting one because you're talking about healthy masculine and unhealthy uh, masculine, healthy feminine and unhealthy feminine. For me, it, 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 a lot of it comes down to, are you being a good man slash woman? And that does come down to moral conduct and it comes down to ethics and that's open to subjectivity. And I'll give you an example of this start that I've given in many different um, interviews and many different scenarios. And the reason I give this example is because it's relevant to today, to, to today's world, but it's also... Um, it's a bit extreme, but in the extremity, you can really see a distinction. Mm -hmm. So if you take a terrorist, a, um, a suicide bomber, for example, that goes in and blows up a, a place, a space, and, and kills many people, the, the proponents of that suicide bomber, his, his culture or her culture, I mean, it's usually men that are doing it, so I'll say his. I, I don't know of a time when a woman's done that. I could be wrong. I'm not sure. Um, I, I've, I've, never, I've never heard of a suicide bomber being a woman. Um, and I'm sure they exist, but they're very rare. The majority are definitely men anyway. So I'll just say his. Um, so when he does that, he's praised by his cultural, his dominant peer group. He's, he's, he's seen as being heroic. He's seen as being moral and ethical. He's seen as doing the right thing. He's seen as being brave. Whereas someone that's, on, that's not part of that dominant peer group, not part of that faction or that, that uh, spiritual group or religious group or political group or whatever it may be, someone that's maybe had their families murdered or victimized in that would see him as a coward, would see him as a killer and a murderer, mm -hmm. would not see him as a saint. And so the same, the same thing has happened. Nothing's changed, but two groups are seeing that person or that act completely differently. And so when we're speaking about being a good d d d person, man, woman, whatever, it is really highly subjective. So, and I say that because the perspective that I would give you would be 
coming from what virtues I see are valuable in people, yes. or in a man particularly. So if we're talking to a healthy masculine man, or even just healthy masculine virtues, let's take leadership, for example. I use this uh, example early and I'll, I'll elaborate on it again. Maybe I'll, I'll go into relationships as well if you, if you want, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stop after this one. So leadership, you can lead in a cohesive way that is also collaborative, but is also assertive and respectful, that carries a long-term vision that is not unhealthy, that is autocratic, oppressive, controlling, that is not subjugating or hyper-selfish, that is not narcissistic. You know, an unhealthy king or an unhealthy leader, the king is just a symbol or an archetype, the unhealthy leader, man or woman, would go to their council but never really have an intent to listen to them, more to appease them, and then go ahead and do what serves them. An unhealthy leader comes from fear and scarcity and doubt, and therefore seeds that in every action that they take and make. Whereas a healthy leader comes from courage and openness and transparency, takes ownership for their actions and their decision-making and is authentically and genuinely confident in who they are. Now the verbiage that I'm using here, again, is, is, is beautifully virtuous, but it's also subjective. Uh, yeah, sure, maybe the majority of people would agree with me, but not necessarily. And so that's my understanding. You know, we're looking at healthy and unhealthy. We're looking at polar opposites in terms of the way we express. So you can take any masculine attribute such as attentiveness. I, I, I thought of attentiveness because it could be a difficult one. So I'll, I'll use attentiveness. Okay. So you can be healthily attentive where you're not doting on someone, where you're not in their space, where you're not consuming them because that can be too intense, right? You can have too much intensity and an obsession in the attentiveness where you become so hyper-focused that everything else just goes and moves in the periphery. And so you've negated all other uh, responsibilities that you've got because you're so attentive to this one thing, experience, person, whatever, argument, you're fixated. Yeah. So long-term, that's not healthy for you. You can be attentive in a healthy way where you choose to not, um, what's it called? Uh, sorry, I just got a mental blank. Uh, multitask. You choose mm -hmm. to multitask and you put those things aside and you give your soul focus, your genuine attention to the situation or the person that's speaking. And you're not, you're being attentive, not to wait to respond because you want to be right, but because, and I'm giving you some examples of unhealthy, healthy, but because you truly want to hear what this person has to say. So there's an example of attentiveness. Attentiveness is a masculine trait per se that every single person has, including animals. They have attentiveness as well. Actually, let's not involve um, other, other things. <laughs> they might confuse people. Um, but attentiveness is something that we all have, we all carry. Yet there's an unhealthy and healthy expression of that. And it just happens to be, you know, a masculine trait. Mm -hmm. But someone might disagree with me and say, well, attentiveness isn't a masculine trait, it's a feminine trait. But it's, it's not, it's not, it's, 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 not, it's sort of neither here nor there. It doesn't matter what it is. There's an unhealthy and healthy expression of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in saying that though, um, I would deem it as a masculine quality because it's kind of, like if you look at the master of time and space, holding holding space, like being more grounded and centered, like being the flagpole opposed to the flag, like it feels more of that energy. And when I sit in that energy and I am being that quality, I feel more, in my, like in this interview right now, right? Like it feels more of a masculine qu quality for me to sit in, in that. It's generally a little bit more cognitive, unless we become... Right more present and presence again is a masculine trait but presence is more in the body yeah and so and, and but it's more of an integration and so there's elements of femininity that come into that and so for a man to be fully present he has to be ta tapping into an integrated version of, of himself which is at some level tapping into some of his uh, feminine expression as well mm, okay and so this is good what about the feminine like unhealthy feminine yeah, yeah, let me, um, yeah, let's use compassion because compassion is a good yeah. one as well. Yeah, compassion is a good one. So we, and, and so empathy, let's use empathy and compassion. So a healthy, empathetic, compassionate person will be able to resonate and ex feel experientially to some degree what the person's suffering is. It could be any feeling state, by the way, or any experience, but let's just use suffering as an example. Um, and they can resonate with that and then a healthy, compassionate person can take action based on what they're resonating with. 
And so they're not disempowered to take action when they're in their healthy state. They're empowered to take action to serve that person and also learn themselves in the process. Hmm. Unhealthy expression of compassion would actually be sympathy, where there's paralysis um, after that follows the empathy, the feeling and the resonance, and they can't take action. They can't help someone. And so the Dalai Lama gives a really beautiful example of this. And he tells a story. And the story is uh, there's a man walking on a path one day in the forest going for a walk. And he sees his friend and his friend has his leg caught under a rock. And immediately this man starts to panic and he starts to get worried. And he starts feeling the pain of the man. And he starts feeling his own leg hurting. And he's wild. He doesn't know what to do. And he can't think straight. And he can't, he can't be present to what's happening. And the man's crying. And he's starting to cry. And he's, and he's just incapacitated. They're both incapacitated. The Dalai Lama says... That's not really him being compassionate. That's him stuck in sympathy and not being able to act and help that man and be, and he didn't use the word strategic, but I will use the word strategic and be strategic. And well, how can he, how can he feel what the man's feeling and then relate to him and then take action to help? And that's an example of unhealthy, healthy as well for compassion. Mm, I like that because sometimes the you, you sometimes you kind of hit this pendulum, right? Like the the feminine pendulum is out here, and you almost like feel so weak and messy that there's no action taking, and you feel like it can be represented that there's no power in it or action taking when that's not true with the healthy feminine. And then you know it's it swings out the other way. So I love that because. I think there's power in both and the same as like yin yang in the world, right? We need, it's, I love that you've mentioned this in the, this, this chat so far, because we need both to function. <laughs> like we can't, otherwise we like, there'd just be too much structure or not enough structure. Like it's like, mm. we need, we need both. What has been, I'd be curious to know what, if you're happy to share what your experience has been with kind of finding this balance between the two for your, for your own experience or what you see in, in clients. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, before I answer that question, I just want to say something to what you just said then about um, we need both. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching the last Airbender last night. It, it's it's a it's a it's a kid it's a kids movie, but it's deeply rich in philosophy. They're the best, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so th- there was this um, there's these two fishes in these two fish in this sacred pond. And they represent the, the balance of life. And one of the villains grabs one of the fish and kills the fish. And the world starts just basically destroying itself until a woman, happens to be a woman going into sacred waters, symbolic, but until a woman sacrifices herself and brings balance back into reality, etc. That's a very important point. But the focus that I'm making that I want to put on here is that we can't have one without the other. We can't have the masculine without the feminine. We can't have the feminine without the masculine. I think that's really important what you said. We need both. And when we really realize that from here, I really, really get that from here, getting it here becomes easy. And what happens is we also oppress less and distance ourselves less and we segregate less. And then we can start moving into greater levels and depths of unity consciousness, whatever that may mean for where you're at within your own level of awareness and development. I think that's really important. Yeah. Mm. Sorry. Remind me of the question you just asked me after that. Sorry. I forgot. So like, I'm just curious on your own experience of finding the balance or the dance between the two, or if you were more one dominant in one and you know, you sh- like if there was a struggle of piecing that together. Finding yeah, massive, massive for me personally. Yeah, yeah. There was, there was, so it was such a struggle. Uh, and there are times now when I still struggle, of course, because the further down the rabbit hole I put myself in terms of understanding polarity dynamics and understanding people and the human mind and my own experiences, the own reflections that I have and make and sit with and be with and feel, um, there's a period of time where there's a transition period where it becomes really overwhelming and daunting and difficult. Mm-hmm. But traditionally in my life, yeah, I've, I've been very, I've been hyper masculine. I've been um, very much in my unhealthy masculine. I've been violent. I've been um, angry. I've been frustrated, ex- excessively agitated. I, I've been very short. I've been uh, dominant, and it's all about. I've been hyper selfish. It's been all about me. You know, like how how can I feel better? at the expense of, of others. It doesn't matter. Um, and then when that got too much, I would still do that, but in the shadows. Mm. And so 
you, you know, I was, I was unhealthy in my feminine. I was unhealthy in my masculine. And, and it was really, I was really extreme in that. Really extreme. Because I thought that that's how men needed to be. Dominating. Uh, you know, domineering. Uh, oppressive. Uh, the, you know, a man's word is the final word. Uh, and, and that, that was just, it caused me so much grief. More for myself, I think, than others, honestly. Because I had to live with myself 24 hours a day. And it was a struggle so often, so often, because I, was con- I wasn't balanced. I wasn't in homeostasis. So I was, I was frequently, when I was paying attention to it, but even unconsciously, I was, that's why I was always agitated, because I was never satisfied. I didn't feel grounded. I didn't feel like I was connected to my truth. I felt I was being something that I really didn't want to be, and I wasn't being. But it was so habituated within me and it was, so, it was such a pr- protective and defense mechanism within me, psychological and relational one, that I didn't know any other way. I didn't want to know any other way. That's mm-hmm. the truth. I didn't want to know any other way. And so what did you do to, to come into homeostasis? Yeah, what didn't I do? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I sought help, professional help, uh, uh, psychologists, counselors, spiritual healers, shamans, energy workers. I spent a lot of time on my own. I meditated. I went deep. I went into stillness. I researched i read i i i let a lot of old stuff go habits behaviors friends ways of being peer groups um i did a lot and that's just that's just touching on it yeah wow and it goes to show the journey right the journey of finding this thing like and if someone's feeling uncomfortable in you know their what they've heard today like perhaps it's they've just been like whoa like i don't even know where i sit or stand or if i'm healthy or unhealthy what kind of advice would you have Mm. remain curious mm. but but and should i say and remain curious and with as little judgment as possible that's what really helped me a great deal as well was can i be open to new ways of being and new ideas without completely shutting it out as soon as i heard it because it was too overwhelming or it's just another thing i need to change or it's too it's too scary or whatever that may be so really embracing the unknown and embracing the mystery was very useful and helpful for me. Mm-hmm. Amazing. And what do you find has been like, like why should someone do this? Like what's on the other side of finding this balance and understanding more about who you are in this healthy way? Growth, happiness, freedom. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, and it's continual. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be challenged. I'm challenged right now in my life, literally. I, I feel I have a sense, to, you know, to share very openly, I have a sense of, uneasiness and restlessness in me and i've had it for probably about mm, about a month and a half it's been you know and i'm and i'm working with it i'm getting to the root of it i'm starting to understand it because i'm I'm deliberately playing with it i'm i'm going into it i'm putting myself out i'm going into it but previously years ago i just ignore it and i just you know i'd I'd lash out but i'm still doing a little bit of that like with my fiance now like i'm noticing that i'm i'm agitated with her when you know the Darling's not doing anything wrong. She's not doing anything deliberate or malice towards me. It's my own frustrations that, are, and, and my, you know, my lashing out now compared to years ago is very different. I was never violent towards uh, women or in my relationships. I was violent on the streets fighting every week. What boys did drink and fight. That's what right. Did, you know? um, and so my frustrations now are different, but I'm tackling this restlessness now. And so, you know, challenge doesn't end. I think, I think challenge is very healthy for us. It, it helps us grow. It's how we embrace it. So how I embrace it now is very different to how I once embraced it. And it's, it's this restlessness is really tough for me at the moment. And so, but ultimately, I know that it's happening for me. Mm-hmm. And there's growth and there's expansion there in the process. And there's deeper levels of love and joy and happiness that I'm experiencing because I'm allowing myself to. And mm-hmm. I know that I've been through enough in my life. And I suppose, you know, experience... And then deeper ref- post-reflection on your experiences really helps. But I know that there's definitely a light at the end of that tunnel. Mm-hmm. I love that. I literally was just having a conversation with another guy, a friend that's like going through a similar experience. Like it's just uncomfortable. And the, the fear to just like sit in the discomfort is like showing up massively. And, and he's so aware of it, which is great because when you're aware of it and you can stay and you can stay and you can reach with the support you need, like it's, mm. it's temporary, right? And there's so much on the other side if we just sit in the discomfort, but it's just that sitting in it that can just be so like painful sometimes. Yeah. And I've found, you know, the, the deeper work that I do here, the more I'm learning about my own internal psychological mechanisms, I almost sometimes find it harder to be 
in difficulty or challenge because I think my perception of how other people see me is that I've got it all together. Yeah. And whilst I do have it together, I fucking also definitely don't. Yeah. So admitting that and owning that in the position that I'm in, and I'm not even a massive influencer in any capacity. I don't see myself that way, but I still have that perception that, oh, my clients or the people that I work with, what if I... So what I'm doing is I'm purposely holding myself, in, a, of course, in a masculine container by being being clear in the expression and still being emotive but not being loose in it, not being completely wild with the people in my life but rather taking ownership of this is what I'm experiencing, giving myself character checks. I do that in my private groups with the men that I work with. I, I, do, I do that with my clients and I let them know that I'm very human still. And that's, to me, actually what I'm finding more and more, that's part of the journey. That's part of the beauty though is that humanness. It's like, yes, yes, you, you know what? You're, you're feeling the stress and you're working through it. Great. Mm, um, so good. And I just want to appreciate you for a moment because the work that you share is unreal. And the way that I see it is like this vulnerability and, and, and like courage, I guess, to actually just share what's up and to share that experience. And like that to me is like, like I want more of that, like to know that it's like, we're not alone when we're going through these hard times. And so I appreciate you for sharing that and honoring that and being humble with that because it makes me relate to you and look up, like look to you more because it's like, you know, I see you like, like that makes me feel good that you are in that too. And we're in it together. So I appreciate the work that you do and, and, and sharing that publicly. It's amazing. Thank you. On that note, where can people go to find out about you? Cool. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that. So my website, stefanosafandos.com or my Instagram or Facebook handle, uh, stefanosafandos. Yeah, they're the best places to to find me. Yeah, They really are. And you you add so much value. So thank you so much for the work that you do in the world. And thank you so much for sharing today, everything you shared and the vulnerability that you've brought even here, but also just like debunking this kind of language for us because... I think it's important. I think it's, you know, what we've just talked about. It's, it's needed in the world that we understand both and how it can help us if we move toward it. Thank you. I appreciate your time and thank you so much. Thank you. (laughs) 